That's you mean if I turn it on, it's better? A home route challenge. Yeah, I got to start all the way over. And I'm going to turn it over to Mike, AE4R. We have too many mics, so we always have to give the call sign to make sure we get the right one. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Please find a seat, please. There's plenty of seats for everybody. Uh, th this, this is the ninth annual, what I call the homebrew challenge. Somebody called it the solder something. I don't even remember who that was. But um, in 2009, we had a, uh, a VWS CW transmitter homebrew challenge. And it was a great success. We had lots of entries. We had judges and test equipment. And, and it was great. And since then, every year, we've had something, solder something. Well, this is the ninth annual one. And uh, I'd like to thank all of those who brought their stuff here tonight. Well, what I plan to do here is to give this thing to the first speaker on, the, on that end. And I'm going to ask him or her to talk about his or her homebrew thing, whatever, for no more than five minutes, and then pass it to the person to his left. And we'll keep going and hopefully get done in less than three hours. <laughs> and so um, what I would also like to do is ask that any of you who have questions to please hold them to the end and go up and buttonhole the uh, the person that you wanted to ask after the after the the whole thing finishes. That way we won't be here until after midnight. So um, uh, I will uh, try to keep time, and if uh, you're the speaker and I I point to you and uh, and and do like this. That means you're done, and please pass it to the next person. Okay? I think we're going to have some fun here. You're going to see some really creative stuff. I hope so. Until you get to mine. Mine's not very creative. But, um, uh, and hopefully this won't be as boring as the 10-meter powwow net. <laughs> and by the way, please tune in on Thursday nights, 8.30 p.m., 28.444, for the VWS... <laughs> powwow net. Okay, who is the first speaker over here? Who is the, the one who brought all this stuff? All right, sir. Uh, please say your, your name and call sign, and, and then five minutes, please. Sure. Uh, my name is John, WB4PBI, and um, I do a lot of remote operating. And one of the things that I ran into is there's a, a thing called <clears throat> an ICOM remote encoder, which basically when you're using um, your uh, ICOM 7300 or other ICOM remotely allows you to tune with the knob, you get push to talk and things like that. But there was no place to plug in a foot switch. So <clears throat> after a few experiments with taking it apart and running into issues and finding out that the two sides of the push to talk button, well, one of them appeared to be at chassis level, it's not. Um, this becomes more of a warning of what not to do. First, make sure you use an isolated jack on the back, one where the basically the, the ring is not connected to the chassis at all. Everything is isolated. Uh, the other is make sure you get it uh, one that is as small as possible because the other problem you run into is there are screws that hold the thing together and then there's a circuit board in there and then there are parts on the circuit board. And so if you get a rather large jack to try to put in there for your push to talk, um, for your uh, foot switch, you find that you, there's no place you can drill a hole where it's not going to interfere with something. So <clears throat> eventually I found a supplier, I think it was the third type of jack that I, I ran across on Amazon, tried ones from HRO and uh, Gigaparts, no such luck, um, and this is working. So it's one of those things when you get your jack, make sure you measure carefully before you start drilling through the, the steel case. And then the other thing is make sure you get an insulated jack. Just to serve a little bit of a warning kind of thing. 
you next? No, I'm not. Yeah. Who's, who's is this? Okay. <laughs> Okay, no, it's not food. My name is Gene, KM4FJ, and uh, I brought something old and something new in the way of dummy loads. Um, back when I was first back getting back into the hobby, this is back in uh, the late 80s, early 90s, I bought a uh, derelict uh, Drake TR4 and uh, got it to work and uh, didn't have a dummy load. So this is back, back in the tube days, we could get by with a light bulb and uh, it, even though it varied in its resistance as the power applied to it, it gave you an indication to uh, you how the signal power, and if it didn't, if it uh, glowed, glowed, glowed brightly and went out, you know, you were overloading your tube, so you could put a bigger light bulb in there. <laughs> uh, if, if you happen to uh, want to pick this up and look at it, uh, be careful. It's got some rough edges. It's crudely made, but the SO239 uh, on one end, light bulb, and the other pop riveted together in the center part and uh, screws on the end so you can get to the light bulb. Um, one of the companies that I think very highly of these days is Elecraft. And one of the things Elecraft has is uh, some low power equipment. They also have a dummy load which you can buy only as a kit and uh, it's nicely made. Uh, you can easily do this uh, on your own. Uh, eight uh, two watt resistors in a configuration that if you put them together uh, it turns out to be 50 ohms. I haven't put this together, but uh, it's a very nicely uh, designed and fabricated printed circuit board. So that's it. Who's next? Me. <laughs> okay. So uh, I tried to buy after I concept from in concept for HP9 CV a Fox and antenna, a two element, as you see for a frequency of the repeater. And uh, the two elements are fitted uh, in this point here. And uh, they are in phase. That's, uh, that means you can transmit with them when you, uh, do both elements are fitted. You want to be, you wanna have a double to uh, signal. That is uh, uh, the uh, right element, Yagi. Um, it was the same. That's it. My name is Luis. I came for ADP. What's next? You. Uh, hi, I'm George WB5OYP. Uh, a couple things. Uh, I've been playing with uh, looking at antennas. I built a HF directional coupler so I could look at antenna systems and see a lot of interesting things with uh, sweeping across the bands that you don't see with the normal just MFJ. I'm also interested in studying this issue with the uh, so-called common mode currents on coaxes. If anyone else is interested in these topics, I'd be glad to talk to you. So this is a little device I made to look at currents on coax shields. The other device I brought here is uh, is a uh, induction heater, not exactly ham gear, but it's uh, it's a 1,000 watt uh, two transistor oscillator called a Royer oscillator circuit. Royer was an uh, engineer at Westinghouse and he built transistor. Uh, inverters and things back in the early days of transistors. So uh, I got a MOSFET board and uh, I was talking to one of, uh, involved with the uh, maker space out in Reston and took a class on blacksmithing. So I got to thinking, well, why not use uh, an induction heater rather than these gas-fired furnaces that take an hour to get set up and drag her outside in the wintertime. So um, I found this coil at uh, HamFast somewhere and I've had it on the shelf for a long time, so I got this, uh, there's a board in here uh, that is, uh, uh, I bought from, uh, uh, it's some uh, Chinese board made uh, that they sell on Amazon. So I didn't bring the power supply in because it weighs about 100 pounds, but you need uh, 48 volts at about 20 amps to run this. But I, can, I have a movie here, if anyone's interested in coming up and seeing it, this is the kind of metal, it's a uh, quarter inch uh, uh, bar. And uh, so uh, by sticking the, and by the way, this, this stuff is the water cooling. The coil does get warm, so uh, to keep it from overheating, I used a little uh, $9 a fountain pump from Harbor Freight and uh, put some water in the bucket and pumped some water through the 
tank coil and the tank coil keeps cool. The other thing is there's some fans on here. They're primarily to cool the capacitors that are across the coil. <laughs> the transistors don't get hot because they're MOSFETs and when they're on they're like zero resistance so they they don't get very hot but the uh, caps and the tank coil you worry about. Uh, so at any rate um, in operation uh, you take quarter inch bar stick it in the middle of the coil in about uh, 20 to 30 seconds the bar will be red hot for about that far and one of the blacksmith instructors uh, is on the video here I can show you and he takes the bar and bends it in a circle so he's he's kind of enthused about it I uh, the, the next thing is to go higher power I think so <laughs> <laughs> this runs uh, self oscillates right now at about 70 kilohertz and it just works on the fact there's going to be an eddy current set up in the bar and uh, it's right in that area of where the uh, this has been done since the uh, uh, 20s. I'm, I'm told the way they got started there was a crankshaft company in Ohio started doing this in the 20s with what they know like now as an Alexanderson alternator. You know it was one of these big machines back then used for transmitting VLF and they uh, apparently ran those machines up into the 60s but they uh, use, uh, used at the time motor generators to make the uh, low frequency AC, yeah, well low being on the order of 20-30 kilocycles uh, to drive uh, their heat their crankshafts. Okay, uh, any questions please see me after and we'll go on from there. Who's next? Thanks. So I'm Leon, NT8B. I have two things here. Um, one I've just started um, I saw this at field day. Mark uh, had his satellite uh, antenna set up, and he was building uh, an antenna rotor, so I thought I would bring this in. This is a little Australian design, and um, a couple things about this that I think are kind of cool. Um, first of all, I'll just show you. It's just an aluminum box. Um, there's a couple of motors in there, that uh, geared motors, that one for the azimuth and one for the elevation, and these are the motor controllers. And then, um, like I said, the other two things that I think are pretty cool is that I um, haven't had a chance to set it up yet, but um, it's controlled by an Arduino um, a little computer. And so this, this is the Arduino here. It's not much bigger than the size of a post stamp, which I think is pretty, pretty amazing these days. And then the other thing that's kind of cool about this is that <clears throat> um, it uses one of these little devices that I think are used in drones probably. It's got um, a barometer in it, but it's also got um, a three-axis gyro. So um, when you get the input from your satellite tracking software, it also determines which way the antenna is pointed and what angle it is, and then it does the calculations, and then using this, it points the antenna in the right direction. So you can just go and set up your antenna, put it on the ground, and um, it'll find itself, and then it'll track the satellites when it's coming over. So anyway, it's not done yet, but um, I've got it started. Then this other little project that I have going here is, um, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, a few, few meetings ago, I gave a talk on uh, ADSB, which is the automatic um, uh, aircraft reporting system. So this is a, a new receiver that I've built. Um, one of the problems that I have with my receiver right now is that um, it sits behind the house, and so I don't, uh, I'm not able to receive any signals um, uh, to the westerly direction of my house. So um, if I go on FlightAware, I can see that there's this big blank spot. So I want to get my receiver up higher. And um, I don't have a, a tower or a mast, and my roof is too dangerous for me to climb on. So I, I built this so that I can run it up in a tree and get it up over the tree line. And so again, what I have in here is a, a simple uh, setup where uh, I have the Arduino here. Uh, I power the Arduino with a um, power over Ethernet um, transformer in here, and then the uh, ADSB receiver is here, and it's attached to the antenna. One of the big advantages of this as well is that the, the feed line length is very, very short. It's only about six inches from the base of the antenna to the receiver, so I'm hoping to um, bump my standing in the uh, in the global standings. I was uh, in close to the top 100. I'm down in the two or 300 range, and I want to try to get up like in the top 25 or so with this. So anyway, just, just messing around with something. Uh, who's next here? There you go. Hi, I'm Ross, KM4HZF. I brought two small items, because uh, most of the stuff I work on is very, very big. Uh, the first item I brought was, some of you saw this at Winterfest, is the test stand. I made for making tiger tails. Uh, basically, you put the antenna in here and have the tiger tail down long, and you plug this into an antenna analyzer and you can get the exact right length. 
And the other item I brought is basically a remote outlet. Oh, one time I got a wireless ceiling fan controller. So, and it's a three-speed controller. And of course it's not working now. It was working earlier, I, I swear. Oh, it's... Yes. There we go. And because it was a three-speed fan controller, I plugged this into my bedside lamp, and I have dimmer control. Who's next? Hey, Rock, before you, you said a word, tiger tail. And so I'll use the prerogative of the last lecturer. That is a tiger tail that goes between the antenna, in this case, the case ground, and it, this is the tiger tail. Wow. What it does is complete the circuit of the antenna. Um, thank you. Thank you much. And, oops, it fell off. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm Kevin, WB0POH. And what I'm showing here, I don't want to pick it up because i got cords all over the place, but... Uh, what you see, what some of you may see, is this setup was I was I this setup was done on QRP to the field. This is an FT817. That, uh, as you probably are aware, FT817 has a display that's extremely small, so it's very hard to read. So I had this great, interesting idea of where I would have the 817 hooked up through its its CAN interface to a Raspberry Pi with a seven-inch screen, and you can actually rotate. The tuner, and you can actually see the frequency. Now I'm running FL Digi, FL Rig on this to to show it. But if you if you could take a look here, you can see the frequency. It changes the band like that, and you can actually read this without having to use without having to. Now I've actually done I've actually transmitted and received with this, and made several contacts, cure heat of the field with this station, and uh, I've actually ran home and ran this station from my home address. And use this to control my uh, my 7300. So I'm sorry I can't show up and pick it up because I'm because I'm now the whole thing is is how I'm I'm actually running this all off a of battery. Now how I did that is I actually am hooking it up through. I bought this from from Best Buy. It's a car and driver uh, 12 volt splitter. And what I did was I chopped off the huh. I'm sorry. Uh, so what happens is, this is a car and driver uh, adapter, and what it does is it has this. Usually, this is a 12 volt adapter system, and it has a 12 volt plug-in on the other side. Well, I chopped it off, chopped off the 12 volt, and put on the um, Anderson power poles, and it works very well. Now, my plan in the future, since it's a touch tree control, I want to be able so I can actually control the radio from the screen, so I actually can, so I wouldn't have to use anything but the knob. To control it, and so, and so, and, and, but for now it's just a simple display, but it comes in very handy, and that's all for here. Any, uh, next, yeah, I'm right here. There you go. Okay, Don Nichols, KV4PH. Um, this lives normally screwed to a pair of wooden shelves uh, beside my uh, rigs. Uh, here is an antenna switch, and down here is a switch to select a headphone plugged into this to go to uh, whichever rig that I want to uh, utilize. I made this with the uh, side wings bent that deep because this switch requires a bit of force to pull, rotate, and push. Uh, it includes uh, a computer as well as two rigs I normally use and a spare and an off position. Uh, that's it. Next victim. <laughs> While I tried to untangle the 
microphone from all of my cables. Right there here. we go. All right, thanks, John. I'm Ron, WA6YOU, and today I have brought a RR49 receiver used in the clandestine service. Uh, this was built, uh, designed by the agency in 1963. The circuit is 10 transistors. It was then given to Collins. Collins Corporation built it till 1968, and then it was given over to Delco, and then Delco built it right through the Vietnam War. Um, we had these with teams out in the jungles of Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. And uh, can you imagine teaching a person with a loincloth and a crossbow and you're teaching him Morse code? <laughs> and I remember doing that many times. So <laughs> don't tell me Morse code's hard. Uh, came with a little pouch, antenna wire. I don't know if you all know about the special antenna wire that we use. It's very flexible and uh, normally out in the bush or the jungle you wouldn't have any pliers with you. It breaks very easy and to strip it very easy with your teeth. The antenna simply sticks in the side here. Let me get a bigger picture. This receiver covers 3 to 24 megs 3 to 24 megs in three bands, has a BFO, it'll do AM and CW, and uh, has a crystal calibrator. I put the 9 volt battery in today. Guys, this thing hasn't been powered up in like 35 years. It's been on my shelf. I got it on a plaque when I retired. I put a battery in it today. I plugged the antenna in. It works perfect. And the crystal calibrator even still works. This was a little headphone that came with it. And it simply, I know some of the uh, gray haired in the audience recognizes these, the way our headphones used to be. And this plugs right into the headphone jack here. And if you want to come up later, I'll let you hear the crystal calibrator tone. It still works perfect. Also came with a grounding clamp, and uh, some insulators if you were going to be there a while. Now, I still have a few minutes. The way I got this, I was over at NSA teaching a course one day. This elderly lady came in the classroom and she said, oh, are you from the, the other agency? And I said, yes. She says, I have three radios in my drawer that have been in there for 35 years. Will you sign for them and get them out because I'm retiring? And I signed for them. <laughs> I'll sign for anything. I gave one to an office director when he retired. I gave one to my supervisor when he retired. And then when I retired, I took one down to the lab and I says, I want this for my retirement. And that's how I got it. OK, who's next? Because <laughs> it's usually mounted to the desk, so. <laughs> right. Um, so I just cleared out some uh, random project stuff I, I had. Um, I don't know if anybody has been to uh, hacker conferences, but these were badges from some of the uh, DEF CON conferences I've been to. And they actually have microcontrollers and puzzles in them. So they have an entire hardware hacking village where you have to then hack in these, modify them, solve the puzzles in them. And if you solve enough of the puzzles, you actually get a special badge, a black badge, that you get into all the rest of the conferences for free for life. <laughs> so there's actually a reason to, to do that. Um, so some of these, uh, this one has like a little, um, little display on it with codes that change. Um, this one, the light on it actually communicates with other badges, and uh, so does this one. So. Um, you start exchanging signals between each other. It's, it's really interesting. Um, and then I, I have some little uh, LED uh, badge projects I did uh, with my kids. Um, and and I, I try and buy these uh, bulk online when I can just because they're great to have in the shack when kids come and visit that I can pull something out and in five minutes they can have something to walk away with. Um, what's that? Yeah, I make them. Yeah, so the, I have them make it. So I pull out the soldering iron, they make a little solder smoke, and 
It's good. The, all the maker um, fairs and stuff like that, they have these set up, so I try and, uh, try and grab some when I can when I see them online. Um, and then some other ones that are just uh, sequent. These were a little more involved. But, um, and then I just did, oh, it's actually in my bag, um, some sewable uh, electronics um, with my uh, daughter. And um, so there's no soldering, so I'm not sure how it counts, but it uses this conductive thread. Um, and so, so she's only six, but she's doing some of her own electronics already. And the, the, this one's actually a little Arduino, and we'll have sensors on it and everything else. So, um, yeah, hand stitch. Yeah, and I'll and I'll grab it out of my bag here and, and throw it up here in a sec. So, um, yeah, that, that's all I've uh, I've uh, oh, and here's some of the the bags of other badges. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's it. Is, uh, next year. Okay, so uh, I'm Dan W3BU, and uh, I, I scrounged from my junk box. I just happened to see this thing in there uh, a year ago, and I was going to bring it in, and I didn't, so I'm making up for time now. Um, this is a um, uh, single channel FM uh, two meter transmitter. And uh, actually, it was built with the intent of, of getting the uh, circuitry together. But I built this. This was built back in the 70s. And I thought some of the folks who hadn't seen this kind of construction might find it interesting, if nothing else. Uh, but this is a 10 watt uh, you know, transmitter. Uh, it actually does work. And it uh, wasn't that hard to put together. I had a lot of resources and stuff at the time. So it was easy to get some of the fab stuff done and put together. But uh, I like this. OK. Uh, thank you. Uh, but uh, yeah. Take a look at it, um, just to kind of see what it is. Uh, as far as I know, it still works. It was working fine when I put it in the in the box, and I moved and kept moving, and it's been in a box ever since. So uh, I I dug it out just to show everybody. Um, show the back to the camera. Just the back. Yeah. Okay. Here's the back. You'll notice there's a heat sink on the bottom of this uh, for the last two transistors, and. Um, Works pretty well, class C amp. Um, and then one other thing, just for kicks, is um, I have a, a, a wristband that I just got from my granddaughter. She made it for me. This is W3BU in Morse code, <laughs> and, and it's and it's correct. So uh, I, I I figured I'd tell her I told everybody about. It. Who's next? Okay, I'm Howard K0LKD. And what I have here is a little <coughs> tri-band go kit. I think I showed this last year sometime. Oops, but it all fits in a in a 30 cal ammo box to include battery, tri-band transceiver, and uh, charging cord and mic and uh, and this is a separate antenna, tri-band antenna. So it all folds up nicely and it's light and. Uh, I've used this on the two meter net numerous times on battery power, so it uh, it works pretty well, all things considered. So uh, I can show you how it folds up later, but uh, that's uh, was the easiest thing for me to do since I'm gonna be on the road next week. So, but anyway, I I like it. It's turned out to be pretty good. That's it. Next. Uh, my name is Brendan, KM4HRR, and I think most of you know by now that uh, my real passion about amateur radio is the emergency communications piece. So most of my projects are based on that, uh, that avenue. So this is um, a Raspberry Pi 3B on the bottom and a new Coastal Chipworks um, TNC on the top. It's called the 9K6. It does uh, move a, uh, a jumper. You can go between 1200 baud and 9600 baud. Uh, which is kind of neat. So I can run this in two different configurations. Um, run a micro SD card inside the uh, Raspberry Pi. And the two configurations are for using WinLink. So this would be when a case is put around it and it's all configured properly with a battery pack. Literally in my hand, I can walk into uh, an emergency situation and have, um, so back up a little bit. Raspberry Pi supplies Wi-Fi. And because of the image and the configuration, it's going to be called Pi Gate. And this device is called a Pi Gate. 
and the first configuration is just a straight Pi gate. So what this will do is, um, you know, we lose all our power, but we still want to get those emergency messages and those forms sent out to other EOCs and other jurisdictions. Take your iPhone out, as long as it's battery powered, or your iPad out, or your laptop out, and you join the Pi gate Wi-Fi. And you put in a very specific 10.10.10.10 uh, uh, you know, slash join, or whatever it is, and it brings up an email client. And as long as you have an account on that Raspberry Pi, you're literally on your phone typing in a very familiar email client. And it will be queued up in here. And as soon as I connect this either DB9 or the 8-pin DIN to my radio, either HF, UHF, or VHF, um, and so the image is, you know, correctly done, um, boom, we're talking uh, RF email, WinLink, uh, in a handheld little low-power device. I run this on a test. Um, well, first of all, I have to thank Ron, the pain, I think he calls himself, um, <laughs> for um, offering his uh, tech station at home and his soldering station, helping me uh, get the... Uh, the top board all so, so thank you Ron you do excellent work absolutely and I like going to Ron's house for any reason because he has such cool gear as you just saw and he's got great stories so um, just bring him some beer and he'll tell you some good stories um, the other configuration just by simply changing the SD card and adding a 3.5 inch touchscreen to the top of uh, the board is the RMS gateway version of a WinLink node um, so there's the touchscreen because you have to do some configuration start and stop services and things like that. Um, so one version is just an email gate, uh, an email client, and the other is a full actual um, RMS WinLink gateway. Um, and these, you can buy these from, I think it's pygate.com, and uh, fully configured with case and screen and everything working, and they're ridiculously expensive, or you could buy everything individual and solder it all together for probably about the third the cost of the completed kit. So I have uh, a buddy of mine making me a 3D case for this, and I hope to have it on Monday. So, uh, and there's lots of documentation up here if you care to read about it and, uh, and or ask questions. So who's next? Let's see. Well, can you hear me? I'm Roger. I'm still KM4 LHZ. I'm going to talk quickly about two projects completely unrelated. Uh, the first project, Pete, Hadley deserves most of the credit, but it has some interesting aspects. I recently purchased, in a competitive bid, a J38 key from eBay. And when I showed it to Pete, he said, you really need a nice base for that. And he showed me how he had mounted some straight keys. So I went over to Pete's house and his fabulous cabinet maker's shop. And he found a very nice piece of what I believe is called bird's eye pine, cut it to size. Uh, chamfered the edges, smoothed it, and then said, now I'm going to tell you the secret of giving it a glass-like transparent finish. And he did. And the secret is you go to your local arts and craft store. I went to Michael's, and you get something called Poron. It has two liquid uh, components. You mix them together. You pour it on the wood. It self-levels. You also shield it so dust doesn't settle on it when it dries. And lo and behold, you get this amazing finish. And the two other finesses on this is I dug out my Heathkit oscillator, which I built 40 or 50 years ago, cleaned off and removed and replaced the old battery, and it still works very nicely. The other small finesse is I wanted a navy knob, and there are people that sell custom parts for uh, historical equipment, but I didn't want to pay the money, so I took a poker chip, spray painted it black, drilled a hole through the center of my drill press, and put it underneath the mushroom knob. Those of you that uh, work with CW know what a navy knob is. It's a mushroom type knob with a flat base, and uh, that worked well also. Okay, the second thing I want to talk about is my favorite topic of filtering high frequency noise from modern furnaces and air conditioning units. I gave a talk on this at the club a while back and since then I've improved upon the original filtering by adding to it. Uh, the interesting story here is that Regal Benoit provides a kit. Let's see if I can separate this. Oops. Like so. Sorry. Uh, the first part of this filter was provided by Regal Benoit, and I have a schematic with me. 
and it plugs into their fan blower motor, variable speed ECM fan blower motor, and it greatly reduced the RFI was, I was getting. But I found later when I made more accurate measurements it wasn't sufficient. So I built and tested a second component. That's the black box. It's a type 31 uh, ferrite filter, which I bought from ferrite, F-E-R-R-R-I-T-E. The type 31 was suggested by, um, let's see, I'm blocking on his name, Mike, uh, who edited the um, RFI handbook for the ARL. And the interesting thing is that if you get the specification, which I have, and look at it, you find that the impedance of a ferrite core filter, here it is, is a function both of the frequency, the ferrite type, and the number of turns through the core. I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but the cable I made loops through the uh, ferrite core three times. And according to the specification, if you satisfy that requirement at 70, let's see, at about 25 megahertz, you get an impedance of 1,200 ohms. And most of my testing to finish the story was done at 28.444 because the noise was precisely such that it was almost impossible to log in and connect to the world's most boring net. And uh, <laughs> I'll leave it up to you as to whether that was a bug or a feature, but I have solved the problem. Thank you. Who's next? Bravo. <laughs> Mike Gruber. I'm sorry, that was the name I was blocking on. All right, hello, I'm Mark, um, KN4IJZ. Um, so I am a college student, so I don't have a house or anything that I can like set anything permanent up on. So to try and solve that problem, um, I have made, um, actually I bought the actual antenna part because I was impatient. But uh, so I have a, a J-pole here, which has a break in the middle. Um, and then I actually got a bunch of other segments that I actually made these, um, so I, soldered them together um, and so I have a J pole that has a about a 10 foot antenna mast um, and the intention here is it all breaks down and I'll be able to make just a, a cloth wrap for it and I can keep it in my car um, and then at some point I'll build like a battery powered go kit or something if I want to have it and so in theory um, anywhere that I am I can set up a station that is um, relatively elevated in the air um, and will perform a little better than anything that I have right now. Um, so that's what I have. Uh, who's next? Okay, I'm Tony, uh, K480P. Um, I have something pretty simple. Uh, it's an RF sampler. Um, I built this. It's a, it's a real simple thing. What I wanted to do was sample my RF going out. It uh, also gives me the ability to uh, uh, look at my modulation for my transmitter. Uh, I have, uh, it's uh, kind of a neat thing. I, ran, I uh, wound a little uh, toroidal coil. Uh, got some, I uh, have a RF uh, voltage divider to provide two different outputs. I have a, uh, a load and a source, pretty simple thing. Came out of uh, QST or uh, ARRL handbook to take a look at it. I think it's uh, may, maybe fairly similar, similar to what George did over there. Okay, thank you. Next. This, by the way, was in the original 2009 oh. uh, CW transmitter VWS homebrew challenge. It's still going. Still, still going. going. Yeah, well. <laughs> you know, the, yeah, we're making progress. Uh, hold on. Next 
So what 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 this is? All right, is a um, homebrew transceiver. And this is, is this even on? Okay. Um, strictly from scratch, and um, the latest installment is it now generates RF at the desired output frequency, plus the image, plus a little LO leak through. So the next step is designing the mixer, post-mixer filters that get rid of all the unwanted um, outputs from my mixer. And actually the mixer itself is uh, kind of an interesting design. Um, it's nothing more than a switch tied to a transformer. And it's clocked with the LO back and forth between the, uh, the windings on the transformer. And I got like 20 dB better rejection of leakage of my LO signal with this design than I did using a commercial uh, balanced mixer from Synergy, which is a fairly high quality, you know, uh, double regular double balanced mixer with using diodes. So that was the latest thing, and then built the amplifier for the post mixer amp, and then that's going to drive the filters when I put them in here. So what's left uh, to do is the post-mix filters, the transmit amplifier stage, and then the bandpass filter for the final RF. And then hopefully it'll be a, about a 16-watt output uh, transceiver. They'll go anywhere from 160 to uh, 6 meters uh, continuously, except for right around the IF at 8.2. So that's... Uh, so that's where that is, and um, I'm starting to run out of room here on my chassis. I don't think I'm going to be able to get the, the final power amp. That's going to have to go in a separate box, I'm afraid, with my other filters. So, anyway, that's about it. I can, you know, I don't know if I can try to plug it in and see if I can pick up anything. Don't give up. Yeah, it's still going. Maybe, maybe one of the younger hams will... Take that project on when you're done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wizard. I appreciate that. Okay, so my uh, name is Jack, uh, K4WY. In uh, my operating world, panic is oftentimes the mother of homebrew invention. And uh, I was merrily working a CW contest with my beautiful uh, iambic keyer, and uh, the spring broke, little tiny things went everywhere. And I'm halfway through the contest. So um, I went to my junk box. I had a couple J38s. We put them together with redneck, <laughs> with expert redneck engineering. There is no Raspberry Pi anywhere near this thing. Uh, we took some uh, plexiglass, and they were rough. This has been most improved since then. Uh, pattern after something I saw at the uh, ham fest in uh, February of one year and uh, this is a uh, is mounted on a uh, kill switch I had for lightning protection sorry about that. Wow. <laughs> so there you go that's it it still works it still has a good motion Well, somebody just said the word Mr. Wizard reminded me of a, a TV show a long time ago. Does anybody else remember it? Well, we have a whole club full of Mr. Wizard. <laughs> anyway, well, after all of that, I'm sort of embarrassed to show you what I've done. Um, I found a uh, six-inch car speaker that had a rip in it. Somebody had stuck his thumb through the... Uh, the, the uh, um, cardboard cone and so I mounted it on a um, on a wine box you know you can get box wine well uh, it, it turned out uh, well I, I put a uh, an old huge hole choke that'll never see service again I glued it in the bottom to give it a little ballast and um, I painted it up and it really sounds good. All of you guys who uh, and gals who check in on the 10 meter net sound really good through this thing. 
really good. Boring, but good. <laughs> well, I wanted to uh, be able to uh, connect up some of my other radios to it. So I had this uh, AB switch box. Remember these things? You see them at ham fest, and you can get them for a buck, two bucks. Stock up. Next time you need to make a project, these things are ideal. I took the um, the uh, old connectors off and put uh, RCA connectors, the phono connectors on the back, and I put my own switch in. It, they do have a good switch in there, lots of wire. But I took all that stuff out and uh, put my own switch. It's a seven position switch, and, and with this switch I can, I can uh, select any of seven radios to route a, a, a cable like this to, um, to the switch or to the uh, speaker. And uh, so that's what I use. Anyway, that's my little project for, for uh, tonight. I'd like to again thank all of the <laughs> all of the uh, uh, home brewers who brought their projects tonight. I'd like to thank the audience for being so uh, attentive. And uh, so, uh, at this point, Mr. President, I, uh, I I think we should declare the program over, but also invite anyone who has questions to come up and talk to some of the presenters if you're interested. Again, thanks to all who uh, who brought their stuff. Let's do this again next year. Door prize tonight. Pay door prize, right? Some time ago, I had some three-quarter inch copper and didn't know what to do with it, and I liked to solder, so I built a, a J pole. And uh, this is what happens when you start out too short. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't tune, but that's a nice thing about copper. You can keep adding on to it, you know, until you run out of copper, I guess. But it's pretty well tuned, and so I have no use for it. But if somebody wants to try, this in their backyard, uh, you're welcome to it, and you can practice tuning it and it have some fun with it. Perfectly at uh, 146, 685 megahertz. For whatever use that is. So if you're interested, come on up and get it. Thanks, everybody, for being here tonight. Just one quick reminder. In two weeks, we need you downstairs in the community room. Have a great weekend.